Hi, it's Bill again, and I'm here with Don. And for the next 10 or 15 minutes, I'm going to talk to you about the origin of money. Um, <coughs> the this, as you might imagine, is sort of a big topic. And um, it's a topic in which there is considerable debate. What's interesting is that some fields have kind of basically decided, well, we don't really care too much about the origin of money. We're going to come up with a theory that we think explains it and lets us get to the next step, but then we're going to be done with it. That's economics, <laughs> with all due respect to my colleagues in economics. In anthropology and in sociology and in some other fields, history and so on, archaeology, um, things look a lot more interesting when we dig back in time and try to look around the world at all peoples and all cultures and understand where the idea of money comes from and how it took the forms that it did. So I'm going to tell you a little bit first about the economist's perspective, and then I'm going to tell you about the archaeology and anthropology of money so you can see the contrasts. So in the economic textbooks, and you have uh, Jevons to read for this class, a classic um, account of the origins of money, you get the following story. In the beginning, there were people and they were all doing their various kinds of things. They were growing crops, they were raising animals, maybe they had access to other kinds of natural resources, wood and rock and metal and so forth. And they would try to get done what they needed to get done for their own subsistence, for their own livelihood. But every so often they would need something else. Maybe they needed um, meat. Maybe they needed wool for clothing. Maybe they needed um, you know, stone for buildings and, and so on. They didn't have it nearby. So what do they do? Well, what they would do, so the story goes, is they would take whatever they had that they were good at, let's say grain, and go and find people who had the thing that they needed, let's say stone, and they'd sit there together with the stone people and the grain people, and they would basically come up with a way to exchange some measure of stone for some measure of grain. This is the classic definition of barter. It's an exchange of two different kinds of goods um, where there's no intermediary between that exchange. I'm not using any money in that exchange. I'm not using any kind of ledger book that says, you know, I am exchanging X tokens worth of grain for Y tokens worth of stone. Instead, I have grain, that's grain, and you have stones, and we just decide, boom, that we're going to exchange a certain amount of one for the other. The end. Now, there's a problem with barter, and Jevons and other economists write about this problem. The problem is, what if I have grain and I have stone, and you've got stone, but you don't want grain? What you want are, let's say, fish. That is a fish. What do we do? Well, we have a particular kind of problem. The problem um, that we have is what the economists call the problem of the double coincidence of wants. The double coincidence of wants basically says there needs to be a kind of, you know, happenstance coincidence that um, you want grain at the same time that, that I want stone, or vice versa. That, that our, our wants basically um, balance out among the people that we're around, that everybody that we're around has the stuff that we need, and we have the stuff that they need, right? But that's rarely the case. So what do we do? Well, according to the economic story, what we do is we invent something that basically sits in between all of our exchanges, that can help us intermediate them, one token or one thing that can be used as exchangeable for all other things. What we do is we invent money. Yay. So money comes in to solve the problem of the double coincidence of wants. So if I need stone and all I have is grain, but you don't want grain, you want fish, what I can do is um, I can buy your stone and give you money. So the stones are going this way, the money's going that way. 
and then you can take the money, find someone with a fish, and get your fish. It's a terrific story. It's a very clean story. It's a very neat and intuitive story that helps us kind of hypothesize about why it is that human beings living in societies would invent money as a medium of exchange. There's a problem with it, however. While this is a great story, and it leads to a great model for thinking about how people can rationally um, assess value and how people can engage in exchanges with one another, when we look at the archaeological record, when we look at the cultures around the world, um, when we look really back to the beginnings, we don't see much evidence of this going on. We see other things instead, um, other things that make us in anthropology and um, history and archaeology want to tell a more complicated story than the barter story or than the double coincidence of wants story. Let me tell you a little bit about some of the things that we see. What we see are people exchanging objects like this. This is from the highlands of New Guinea. Um, you can see it's a very beautiful sort of shell necklace thing. There's one big shell here. This is called a kina. There are some fish vertebrae and bones, little beads of wood. This is um, not that old. I mean, it's from the beginning of the 20th century, so about 100 years old. But there are much older um, objects like this that you can see in museums and so forth. And what this would be used for would be when, um, a f when families get together to arrange marriages, there would be the presentation of these sorts of objects basically to seal the deal. Now, you might think that's not really money. Well, what it does basically is create relationship relationships of exchange between families. It says by putting this on the bride, the bride's family and the groom's family are now connected. And there's going to be exchanges between those families into the foreseeable future. There's going to be exchanges of love and labor, but also things like pigs in the highlands of New Guinea, food crops, fish, and so forth, in a kind of generalized reciprocity, a kind of generalized sharing, all symbolized by this thing. Right? So early anthropologists seeing this were like, you know, this is kind of like a money object. Um, it itself isn't really being used in exchange, but it's kind of symbolizing all of the exchanges between kin. So that's one of the kinds of things that, that we saw. Now, when European colonists saw things like this in the 17th, 18th, and 19th centuries, when they went to um, the Pacific, when they went to Africa and saw similar um, things made of shells, they very quickly seized on the idea that this was money and they started to circulate their own money object in those communities, um, primarily to buy raw materials, but also slaves. So all throughout West Africa, for instance, from the, in the 17 and 1800s, Europeans um, got themselves into the trade in cowrie shells. These are cowries. Um, they've been cut to indicate that they've been sort of marked by, by human hands so that they now circulate as a thing of value. Um, and these would be used basically to purchase all kinds of goods uh, as well as slaves. The important point here is that what's happened is a transformation from this kind of object to this kind of object. In societies where people were using this thing, they were thinking about the relationships that it forged and then all of the exchanges that would happen because of those relationships. When European colonists started using these things, they were really trying to start inventing a kind of money that would be a general purpose money that could be used for everything, including um, buying other people. Okay.